I'm like, it is funny how there's like a different odor yeah. that comes along when you're stressed out. You, it's like, what? <laughs> Didn't I take a shower this morning? Oh, 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 oh. Thank you for listening to Beep, I Wish I Knew in My 20s. So this podcast is hosted by me, former high school dropout turned network TV correspondent. I had no mentors. I had no big sisters. I had nothing. So I had to figure it out on my own. And now I want to help you figure it out. And I've got a squad of friends who knows some stuff. That takes me to Jerika Duncan. Thank you so much for being here, Jerika. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, I I fell in love with you the moment I met you. This week's guest is Jerika Duncan, anchor of the Sunday edition of CBS Weekend News and a national Edward R. Murrow award-winning CBS News national correspondent. But this incredible journalist had a very different career in mind when she started out, and it might surprise you. We're going to get to that. We got to help the next generation of women know what we didn't know in our 20s. And I mean, hey, we're pretty good. We're doing okay now, but we didn't know everything. Right. So still learning. <laughs> you're always learning, right? Until until you're dead, you're always learning. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you don't know and what- Not to die, know. by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> Not to die. The goal is to keep learning and keep wanting to learn. Sometimes people don't want to. They just good with where they're at. Every day I learn something new. And I'm gonna about to learn some new things about you, my friend. What made you get into news? There was the subconscious part of me that that always knew I was probably headed in this direction. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, I wanted to direct music videos. I was the kid watching like the MTV how to make um, music videos and seeing how they sketched it out with treatments and ideas. Wow. Um, I worked at Arista Records, was my, one of my first internships as an 18 year old. My uncle worked there at the time and he worked with the subsidiary record company that was under Arista, but I got to see a little bit more in terms of how things get done, how videos get made. Um, went to school, thought that was going to be the focus. The more I sort of got into the video production aspect, I was like, eh, this takes so long for this, <laughs> this yeah. little bit of, you know, five or four minutes. But I've always had a news bug too. Like me and my mother would stay up and watch 2020, you know, with Barbara <laughs> Walters. Um, and Hugh, is it Hugh um, Downs? Hugh Downs. Yeah, Hugh Ooh. Downs, yeah. So I was always a curious child, a nosy child, somebody that asked a lot of questions. and had a vision in terms of how to put things together from a television standpoint. So by the time I got to college, I uh, decided to stick with the more journalism route and started applying for internships in that realm while I was still in school and then put my tape on a website. And I don't remember the name of it. I don't even think it exists anymore, but it allowed news directors to categorize what they were looking for and sort of match them up and look at these different reels. And it was someone at a journalism convention that told me that's how they got their first job. So I put my reel up and I got a call from a general manager in Elmira, New York. I did not even know how to pronounce Elmira, New York. I don't think I've I was, ever been there. Yeah, so it's got a lot of history, mm -hmm. great little town, still got love for Elmira. But that's where I started. <laughs> And I was there for two years, went to Buffalo for three years. Then I went to Philadelphia for three years and I've been in New York ever since. So I got started because of my love for creating and wanting to showcase women in music videos in a different way than how they were being showcased at the time when music videos were very popular. But I ended up where I am now, which is doing news and still being able to create, but just not in the way that I thought I would be. You know, at the end of the day, you've got this minute and a half, two minutes, this little story that you've put together. And that's what always brought me to it, is that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're done. I really do enjoy that day turn. For people who don't know, day turn means you get it done in one day. Yeah, I, I like agree. That. It's kind of exciting because it keeps you fresh and new, and new, like moving on to the next thing. 
But I have to say, the older I get, the more I want to spend a little bit more time with some of these pieces. I just think that we're not in a, like the, the way we're moving in terms of our industry doesn't always allow for that. And anything that you're going to dedicate that heavy time to probably is going to be during your off time. Yeah. Because it's so rare now that you have companies or organizations that will really pay someone a decent salary to investigate a topic for months and months and, and know that maybe they might not produce what you all initially talked about in terms of what the piece is or what you think it's going to be. When we tell stories, we're all just a little bit more connected. Now I can see the story of a person who lives over there or lives over here or has a different experience than me. And mm -hmm. right now this world is so divided. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of brings me to, and I, I and we, this is called beep. I wish I knew in my twenties, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. But I also want to talk to you about what you've just been through. You just went to Buffalo, a place that you had spent three years. You loved it there. And you went there to cover this incredible tragedy of 10 people being shot just for the color of their skin. And I can't imagine how tough that must have been. What stayed with you most? The people who heard the gunshots the people who live in that community, the trauma inflicted on a group. We all know we have a birth date and a death date, but when people are murdered, executed in such a targeted way, it just hits different. It feels different. There is no long goodbye, perhaps if someone's dying, you know, they have an illness that we know they're, they're not likely to make it. And there's time to say goodbye. Uh, the idea of an 86-year-old woman being shot, um, the idea of a person being killed and, and the gunman doubles back and shoots them again in the head to, to ensure that they are dead um, is traumatizing to report on. And I think even more traumatizing for the people who live there, work there, and will inevitably go back to that tops. You know, and I just think no matter how much you wash it down, change the entrance, give it a new look, it will forever be the site of the place where 10 innocent people who went shopping on a Saturday afternoon were gunned down. So it does sit with you. It's something I don't take lightly. I don't take any mass shooting that I've ever covered lightly, but I think naturally it feels personal because I did live in this community, not specifically in East Buffalo, but in the Buffalo community for three years. And even though it's been over 10 years since I lived there, I'm very much still connected to people that I consider family. Um, one of my really close girlfriends who's always been in the forefront in terms of justice, community, activism, um, she was outside, has been out there serving food, and just learned yesterday that she passed out. I'm not sure exactly all the details of what happened, but at one point they had her on a ventilator because she couldn't breathe on her own. She is no longer on the ventilator and able to breathe, but I, I really feel like the trauma of what she experienced as someone who grew up there, she's 61 years old, um, has incredible stories of racism that she's faced in that city. And I believe that the stress of what I've been reporting on has had an impact on her overall health. And I think that's gonna be true for a lot of people. It's gonna be hard to directly prove, but I think just like so many tragedies, um, there's, a, there's an aftermath, there's, a, there's an after effect of what it means. So that's what I'm most concerned about. And, you know, I'm committed to going back there, whether it's on my own or to tell these stories, just to check in and just to see how the community is doing, how Buffalo as a whole is doing, because it is a great city filled with amazing people. Um, but the scars of the past have not I mean, it's a community, I should say, that, that has scars from the past that haven't completely healed. So the more, too, you pull back the layers, that particular area, Jefferson Avenue of East Buffalo, was thriving 
you know, they had businesses and um, it was a community that was actually somewhat diverse at one point, um, but due to um, riots in the 60s, white flight, uh, the, the building of a major interstate that runs right through uh, the city. So you don't necessarily have to go through those communities mm -hmm. where maybe you had more traffic, more traffic means more business, more business means more money circulating in the community. So there's so many things I think when we, when we look at that story um, that we're now looking at, maybe we weren't looking at it before this tragedy and perhaps there's something good that will come out in this community in 10 or 15 years we'll be talking about how, how much better it is and how it's thriving. Um, but yeah, it is tough to cover. You, you're still processing it in many ways. Just as I told anybody who's asked me or checked in, it's like, just keep this community in prayer. Just really keep them in prayer. And if you have resources, donate, you know, find, find a way to, to really get involved. It is not easy to see something like that happen. And so what advice would you give to you know, maybe someone in their 20s who, um, a person of color in their 20s who's watching this on their TVs. If you don't have someone that you trust to speak about these things, um, that, that you can freely assert how you feel, find that. And, if, and, and when I say that, it's not just getting help from a psychologist, although I recommend also seeking a therapist mm -hmm. out if you feel like, you know, it's deeper than just having somebody to talk to, but I think it's important to, to get it out and find out, you know, find an outlet for yourself that works. So for me, sometimes it's running, it's working out, it's taking time to rest. It's taking a long shower or a bath, but you have to find small ways to acknowledge how you're feeling and regroup. Sometimes it's in reading scripture or the Quran or you know whatever it is. And I'm not saying I read the Quran, I read scripture, I read the Bible, but whatever your mode of finding that peace is, do it. Yeah. And, and it doesn't even have to be this type of trauma, right? Because there's work trauma of like deadlines and pressure and Somebody recently who just got out of the business, they kind of, it was a funny comment, but it was like, oh my God, that's so true. She's like, I no longer have the stress sweat. And it, it always used to mess up my suits. And I'm like, it is funny how there's like a different odor yeah. that comes along when you're stressed out. You, it's like, what? <laughs> Didn't I take a shower this morning? But Guilty. who thinks about that? Who thinks about that? Or who would think about that? But that was very real. And she was just explaining how the stress, sweat, stress in general has just yeah. come all the way down. As much as she loved what she did, there's a point in time that, you know, some of us will have to make a decision that has to be made, I should say, where it doesn't make sense to keep putting yourself through this for what? I think it's a great career. I think many of us obviously at this level are blessed to have sort of made it to this point because not everyone gets to work for a network and have and these different great experiences. Network. It's a great network. Yeah. Um, but I, I get it. I get why people decide that maybe, maybe their knowledge and expertise could be used to do something else. And they can but sleep it, in. <laughs> they can sleep in. You could write a book. You could go to the gym regularly. All those things. There's some great benefits that come with what we do. But then I think there are times where, again, it's not just covering a mass shooting where you have to check in with yourself and find those moments of peace. It's just the, the, the day in and day out. Oh, yeah. No, it is a lot. I think in any career, I mean, this is we're in a career that just takes, takes, takes and keeps pushing, pushing and wants more. And many careers are like that. So for young people in their 20s, you got to take the time for you. I did mm -hmm. not. And there was a whole slew of time that I missed every holiday and every Christmas. And you know what? I had to fill in anchor. I was like, oh, no, this is my opportunity to fill an anchor for on Christmas, on New Year's. You know what? I won't get those back. I'm not unhappy. I'm never going to go back and say, oh, well, I wish I did things differently. But now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to hang out with my family. And you have different priorities as you get older. Um, but meanwhile, if they ask me <laughs> here, I'd probably still say yes. Anyway, um, <laughs> I will say one thing about the stress sweat. Okay. 
And I told a friend this the other day and she was like, <laughs> her mind was blown. Yeah, because this is something I could have used in my 20s. Right, this is important. I'm gonna save you all in the, your 20s right now. You take panty liners and you put them in the in ah. your suits. And then it's, you know, it kind of soaks up the sweat. I could see that. I've also, lemons, <laughs> lemons help. Did yeah. you know that? I didn't know. Lemons can help with that. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Right then. Okay, we're done. Everyone got what they needed. No, just kidding. I want to ask you a little bit about through your 20s. I mean, you know, it looks like you've got everything together now and you look gorgeous and you go out there and you're doing all the things. You know, you're a big time Thank anchor. You. Big time anchor at network, right? And but there had to have been times in your 20s when you either made a mistake or you didn't know that you were gonna get here. And so what advice do you have for people in their 20s based on some of the stuff you wish you knew in your 20s? Are you ready for this? This I this am is, I got a pun based <laughs> off what we just talked about. Yeah. Can you guess what I'm gonna say? Oh god, no, I don't. Oh don't. No, you go, you go. The small stuff. (laughs) I thought you were going to tell me that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Oh, that's another one too. That's another one too. On a a serious note with that question, because it's a very important question, is understand it's a moment in time. It's not, and, and I'm still learning that at almost 39 Like it's, it's a fleeting moment. Obviously we have things that we dedicate ourselves to, whether it's a relationship or mothering, you know, you can't just treat it like a fleeting moment, but by and large, you know, everything is up and down. Right. And it's just trying to find balance as things are constantly evolving it's a lot easier said now, but 20, like two, 23, when I first got into the business, I remember writing a diary and honestly just being completely just lonely and mm-hmm. exhausted. And, you know, I had my little group of friends that I made at the station, but um, there's a lot of downtime. And when you're in a small town, when I was off two days a week, I just remember trying to find activities to get involved in, but you go from, and I think it's very natural, an environment of of college where everyone is between the ages of 18 to 24, basically, Mm -hmm. to the real world where maybe at the station, everyone's in their 20s. Um, Managers might be in their 30s or 40s. You know, it's it's still, you're, you're, you're around younger people, but you're around like this is the world. So the people you're interviewing too, they're not all young, they're older, they're younger, they're in wheelchairs that you're like experiencing this, this real world experience that you were sort of sheltered when you're in college. So you have to adjust to that. And a lot of us starting out in a small town where there's really not a a lot going on, or you are away from your friends and your, you know, sisters, brothers, cousins, the people that sort of keep you grounded and keep you just excited about life. Mm -hmm. So there's an adjustment, but I remember keeping a diary and looking back on that diary before I left Elmira. And I like, I think I burned it because I was like, oh my God, you were so depressed. And it's not like I did, it's not like I didn't like Elmira. I actually had a pretty good time, but just, you know, it's a tough, it can be a tough adjustment. And I just feel like people need to allow themselves the grace to to feel the feels of like, yeah, this can suck sometimes. Or if you know, you're not dating anybody, it's like, dang, you know, I was just in college. I had all these people and dudes from, and now it's like, what are we doing? Now you're in some, and this is really good advice for people because you'll move a whole bunch of times in your twenties. You might, you might. I mean, most people do move from college to somewhere. And I, I moved a couple of times and I remember thinking, oh, I've always made friends before. I'll make friends here and no. That did not happen for me in some some places that I moved to. And I was like, I got nobody like me around here. Like no one I kind of vibe with, no one that I that gets me. That was tough. But I think looking back again, it's like it's temporary. Yeah, don't like if I could that. looking back, you, you and you put so much pressure on yourself in your 20s. It's it's unnecessary. It's really unnecessary. But did you think in your 20s that you would be where you are now in your career? 
Absolutely not. You know, I was really? making eighteen thousand dollars a year, and unsure of if I was even going to continue to do this. I remember. And I've said this before, giving myself like three to five years in my mind and thinking like, if I'm not advancing, you know, I know I'm smart enough to do some other things that I could have a decent life. You gave yourself three to five years and and look at you now. Like you had, I just love this story. Thank you. Yeah. I just, I, I knew I wanted to give it a little bit of time before I like gave up or decided like, maybe this isn't for me. Yeah, I but no, I don't like... think I don't think anybody, Deborah. When you really think about, it, I don't think anybody ever knows. Like, especially when things actually pan out well, I don't mm-hmm. think. I mean, maybe there are some people that really felt like deep down inside, I saw this for myself, and that's great. <laughs> but that's not my story. I, I've always sort of been. Although one of my girlfriends said, "You always said you wanted to work at the network," and I'm like, "I did. I don't ever remember. <laughs> I don't ever remember <laughs> saying that." But perhaps I did, and maybe maybe there was a part of me that always felt that, but I didn't know what that really looked like. And remember, I came here, I was offered the job while I was 29, technically. Not this particular job I'm in, but as a newspaper correspondent. And I was five, six months pregnant. Wow. And, and hiding it because I didn't want anybody to, to know I wasn't married. Here I was, you know, I think so many people have the expectation of what your life is going to be like. And then it's not. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, this isn't maybe this isn't a good look that I let these kids down that admire me because I'm out here, you know, I'm not married. I'm having a baby. OK, am I going to take this job in New York? I met with David Rhodes, who's the former president. Yeah. After he offered me the job because I wanted him to know, like, hey, I have a baby on the way and I don't know that I'll be able to do what I think you guys want me to do, which is jump on planes and cover things like, yeah, as soon as they happen. And he said, well, do you think you can handle it? And I said, I think so. And he said, well, there were many women before you who had children and there will be many women after you. So if you feel like you have the support you need, let's keep it moving. I was so afraid and thinking they were going to take this opportunity away and or that I really didn't have what it took on top of being an expecting mother but it was the best thing that probably could have happened to me at that time because you know it forces you to grow up a little bit and just have confidence and believe in yourself even though I still didn't really I was still kind of working through that but it was nice to know that I had the support at the time of the president of CBS who said, you know, we're not going to take this away from you. We're not going to send you back to Philly. We're going to trust that, you know, we see something in you, that you could be an asset and we'll figure it out. It has worked out. So that's an incredible yeah. story. That was, I didn't know that. was that. coming out of the twenties. That was coming out of the twenties. So I think that's so we about, inspiring. We about to go into the forties. Smoothie <laughs> trying to be healthy because that's what you do when you're in your forties. You drink. Smoothies. Well, I mean, and also, <laughs> you know, your smoothie matches your shirt. I mean, like you are styling here. Thank you. <laughs> I even, and look, I even have a laptop that matches the shirt. Oh my god. Oh, mine does too, but I can't show you because I'm using the thing. But oh it's okay. God. I, I'm loving this story because, you know, I think many people in their 20s and sometimes in their 30s and sometimes in their 40s, uh, you know, we don't we don't have the confidence to know that we can do something like and that's OK. So when people see someone like you who has you know, the success that so many people would love to enjoy and you weren't sure about yourself and you didn't see this for you. It's okay if you're in your 20s and you don't see what's ahead of you or you don't see the, know that you can do the thing that you want to do. I don't have the confidence sometimes. I'm like standing there at the White House going, oh, Jesus, that's Major Garrett over there. Right. Talk about intimidated. I don't know what that guy knows. And you know what? I figure it out. Yeah. Because I have Google. <laughs> you know, like, let's be real. What else? And you're How a smart we... person. You're just right. as capable. You're just as yes. malleable, just as capable. And you're doing the damn thing. Exactly. And I think we all have to kind of realize that it's not about being arrogant or cocky. It is sometimes being able to look in the mirror and say, I got this. I can do this. I can show up today. And, and when you know you're doing the best that you can, 
what more can you ask for? And that thing about looking in the mirror and saying, you got this, like you got to do that every day because the business that we're in, we've got to be confident Mm -hmm. even when we're not. (laughs) Right. And I was going to say even practicing, you know, I'm never too good to go over those lines over and over again, because I don't think it's still something that I work at. I think we all hopefully, you know, still work at mm-hmm. it. And it's, yeah. it's not that it's, it becomes super easy. I think you no. just become more comfortable in your own skin. Yes. So, and when you know the subject matter, or even if you mess up, you can say, you know what, let me do that again. You know, or I see sometimes it, it hasn't happened in a while, but I remember one time um, watching Gail on the anchor desk and she's somebody I admire tremendously because mm-hmm. of how classy she is, right? Yeah. She's such a classy individual and honest and real. She wants everybody to win. You don't always see that sadly in our industry because it is super yeah. competitive, but um I remember one time she was reading something from the prompter and it messed up. And she said, I'm sorry, let, I got to do that again. Can you roll that back? And this was live <laughs> TV. Now, of Love course, her. we don't always have prompters when we're out in the field. But I do think even when you stumble, you just keep going. I think that's been my thing. Like, even when I know what I just read made no sense, I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to take a breath. And if we have time to redo it, I'll redo it. Um, but it does happen to the best of us. And I don't think that ever stops. But yes, how you view the mistake and how you choose to either, I think it's fine to kind of feel a little icky about it for a second, but then it shouldn't dictate like the rest of the evening. I mean, unless yeah. it's really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> just, don't, just don't like word vomit yeah. on live TV. People. Don't word vomit and don't say anything that's going to get you sued. Ooh. No, you don't want to do that. I am so thrilled that you are here. This has been so much fun. I got one last yeah. question for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tell me if you will, mm-hmm. something that happened in your twenties, like um, a bad date, a bad outfit that you remember, a, a job that you were like, what was this job that Ooh. I had? Some kind of thing in your twenties that you're like, oh, I can't forget this. <laughs> I definitely wore suits that were too big. And I wasn't wearing makeup at the time. I think it's important to wear a little bit of coverage because of the lighting. Yeah. And sometimes how we play in person isn't how we play on TV. Yes. And it took somebody to tell me, you know, even something like your eyebrows, you know, you you pluck them so they're not really even. You might (laughs) want to draw them in a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay. So yes, yeah, eyebrows are there, a there's thing. a certain level of grooming that that happens or you just sort of recognizing what works and what doesn't. And listen, like I said, I'm still, I can look at things two years ago and be like, ooh, my hair. Ooh, nobody told me. Mm-mm. Mm. Those edges. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but, a um, good friend will tell you. A good friend's like, oh. Oh, they do. Ooh. They have no problems letting me know, you know, if the hair ain't right but most of my friends are very supportive and I'm like girl you look fine the story was good that's what mattered so this has been lovely and I hope that the people who are listening whether they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s you know definitely take away from understanding that uh we are all just doing the best we can every Mm. day every one of us we're all very similar we practice you know practice too we, we, we sweat the small stuff at times. We don't know what's coming for us, but you know what? If you hang in there and you give yourself some grace and you make a smoothie that matches your shirt, you're going to be okay. On that note. Smoothies make everything better. Smoothies. There you go. That's a beep that you did not know in your 20s and now you do. You can see Jerika Duncan on CBS Weekend Evening News on Sunday nights. And don't forget to follow her on Instagram at I am that reporter JD. Make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already. Tell a friend, leave a review. It helps more than you know. You can also watch this interview on YouTube. Follow us on Insta and TikTok at Deborah Alfarone for more beep I wish I knew in my 20s. And drop your email to be the first to know about new episodes. And guess what? I'll send you my free GTFO confidence guide. Just drop your email at pages.debraalfarone.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.